Tonight's subject, you may find it a little bit spiritual. I do not apologize for it, for I always believe that whatever is most profoundly spiritual is in reality most directly practical. When we open the Bible, we are in the midst of mystery. It's not secular history, it's sacred history. It has nothing to do with individuals who lived and walked the face of this earth. It has all to do with you. So when Paul said, great indeed we confess is the mystery of our religion. By mystery, we do not mean a matter to be kept secret, but a truth that is mysterious in character. If we do not know this and we haven't had the vision of never experienced scripture, then we are as misled as many a church person, really. There is a book today that's very popular, written by a bishop of the Church of England. It's called Honest to God. It has swept England, Canada, and this country. It's a bestseller. And the bishop, Bishop Robinson, he said Christianity is rooted in a myth, an imagery that no longer has application to modern scientific man. And he calls upon the Christian church to strip itself of much of its traditional doctrines, such as the incarnation of Jesus. Now, this is a bishop, one who is in control of so many who are leaders in the church, but he's never had the experience. He knows nothing of the Christian mystery. And seeing it through his secular eyes, he doesn't understand it. Tonight, the subject is my husband. This is taken from the 54th chapter of the book of Isaiah. The New Testament interprets the old, not the other way around. So here we speak of my husband, and this is the quote, your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. The Lord called you as a bride, forsaken and grieved in spirit, for a brief moment the Lord forsook you, but he will comfort you and gather you with great compassion. For a moment he hid his face from you, but with everlasting love he will have compassion upon you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. Now when you read it, how could we be the bride of the Lord? Or if he is my husband, then I must be a bride. And if he is the husband of my wife, well then, she is his bride. This is addressed to every child born of woman. Your maker is your husband. But this is a great mystery. To understand it, we must search the scriptures. And we go back to the very first use of the word. The word translated husband is the Hebrew ish. We find it in the second chapter of Genesis. And there is translated man. There's a huge big capital. And man must leave his father and mother. Leave all and cleave to his wife until they become one flesh. 
one flesh. So this is the man spoken of who is the Lord. When you see it, then you will understand the story of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, he is the personification of this man. We are his emanation, his wife, till the sleep of death is past. And he will not leave us until he fuses with us and we are one. It is God's purpose to give himself to man as though there were no others in the world, just God and man, and eventually only man. For the fusion will be complete. There will only be you, and you will be God. That's the story. The God himself enters death's door. All this with those who enter, and lays them in the grave with them, in visions of eternity, till they awake and see Jesus, and the linen clothes lying that the females had woven for them. If my mother wove this garment of flesh and blood, this is the linen cloth she wove for me. And God himself entered death's door, this scar, when I entered. And he lay down in the grave with me in visions of eternity. Now, how will I know it? How do I know he actually did that? I must read the story of God. For the story of Jesus is an acted parable. The most audacious prophecy of what one day will really be the experience of the believer. So you and I are told the story. Does it fall on barren ground or receptive soil? The soul goes forth to sow, and he sows the word, the message of salvation. And some hear it and willingly accept it, believing all things are possible to God. Others hear it, and like the bishop, rejects it. That is a myth, a strange imagery that has no basis whatsoever in this modern scientific age. Others hear it and love to believe it, but the cares of the day are greater than their faith, and it strangles it. But there are a few of us who hear it, and we are quite willing to go through hell for the fulfillment of that prophecy that God will give himself to me and so completely give himself to me that when he rises in me I am he. Well how will I know it? Well his story tells me how I will know it. It happens suddenly as I walk the earth. It comes like a thief in the night because at one moment in time the word was planted engraved, implanted upon me, and I believed it, and then it grew in secret. For he who began the good work in me, he promised he would bring it to completion at the day called Jesus Christ. Well, what is that day called Jesus Christ? Well, I must read it. The bishop wants me to simply scratch from the page the incarnation of Jesus, because he doesn't know the mystery. Of one billion Christians in the world, what percentage really do know the mystery? To think a little child was born 2,000 years ago in some strange, unique manner, that's not the mystery. Christ himself, which is God, the word Jesus is Jehovah. If I spell it in Hebrew, it differs somewhat, Yorevav He is Jehovah, Yorevav Shinayan, and there's a reason for Shinayan after Yorevav, but the core of the word, the root is Yorevav. 
And the word means Jehovah saves. As we are told, I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And besides me, there is no Savior. It's the same being called Jesus, entering death's door, the human skull, and becoming the dreamer of that man. And all things are possible to man if he knows who is dreaming. For all things are possible to God. If I know who the dreamer is, my own wonderful human imagination, and that is Jesus Christ. Are you ashamed, embarrassed, you feel offended? Well, I speak from experience, I am not theorizing. So when this one begins to stir within me, and your soul, he is risen. The word risen in Greek, when defined in the concordance, the biblical concordance, it means to awaken, to rouse from sleep, from the grave. And that's exactly the experience that you have. When that moment in time comes for you to begin to awake, and you do awake, you have no feeling that you were dead, you were asleep. And the only thing that conveys death to you is where you are when you awake. You are in a sepulchre. You are in a grave, and the grave is your skull. And you know it is a tomb. That's the only thing that conveys to you the feeling that you must have died. Or if you were not dead, someone thought you dead, for you find yourself in a grave. And the grave is your skull. And then you come out of your skull, just in the manner that a child is born, to find the symbol of your birth in the form of a little infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. And he would take from the Christian faith that sink, that sign of the incarnation. And may I tell you, it is everlastingly true. That child is everlastingly waiting to symbolize your birth, your resurrection. Now let us turn, because the first act is the act of the resurrection. In the 11th chapter of the book of John, there is a conversation between a woman called Martha and the one called Jesus Christ. You listen to it carefully, and let me remind you, it is not secular history. This is sacred history. For our evangelists were not describing events and things of the past as historians. They desired to pass on the message of salvation as preachers who themselves experienced salvation. They were not historians. They were men who were describing this strange supernatural being that began to awaken in them. So in this conversation, Martha makes the statement, had you not left us, our brother would not have died. And he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. Do you believe this? And she answered, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. Listen to it now. He who is coming into the world. That's the translation from the Greek. The King James Version gives this for that Greek passage. He who should come into the world. But whether I say he who should come into the world, or he who is coming into the world, it implies he is not in this world. So here I am the resurrection and the life. You believe it? Yes, Lord. I believe and the voice tells me what she believes, and then ends on the note, he who is coming into the world. Yes, it comes in, in you, not something on the outside. The story is told to man, and then the one who tells the story, the storyteller, disappears. 
as we are told, it is expedient for you that I go away. And so the great storyteller tells the story of salvation and becomes invisible to man. He who dwelt among men now dwells in man. He dwells in man so man can see him. And he's looking for him to come from the outside, hoping in some strange way to see him come in the clouds. And they're all looking for a second coming of this being on the outside. You know, the story was told to man. And the storyteller becomes invisible because he takes up residence in man. For his name is I Am. That's the name of Jesus. It's yod Hey vav Hey. Go tell them, I Am has sent you. If they ask anything, just say, I Am has sent you. That's my name forever. And by this name I must be known throughout all generations. Well, don't you say, I Am? But you're looking for something other than this presence. And may I tell you, the fundamental sin is lack of faith in I am He. You can't blame man for not accepting the fact that he himself is the presence that he is seeking. But the day will come, he will know it beyond all doubt, because everything said of Jesus Christ in the scriptures, he himself will experience. And when he experiences all these things, he knows who he is. And he's not looking for him to come from without, for he came from within. That's where he entered. God himself entered death's door, the human skull, and laid down in the very grave of man in visions of eternity. When you have your visions, your dreams, whether it be night dreams or day dreams, these are the visions of eternity. Until you awake. And that long stretch will last 6,000 years. When it comes to its end, you will say with Blake, I behold the visions of my deadly sleep of 6,000 years. Dazzling around thy skirts like a serpent of precious stones and gold. And then this is what's going to happen to you. With his words, but you need not use his words, you will look and you will see the blood of God. It's golden liquid light. And this is what you will say. I know it is myself. And then you will cry out, O oh my Creator, I'm Redeemer. Your Maker is your husband. And as a husband, he leaves all, cleaves to you, until you become one. Not two, one. And you will say, I know it is my very self. O oh my Divine Creator, I'm Redeemer. And then you, fused with the blood of God, will ascend into heaven. And you will know the mystery of this great character, this supernatural being, this chief actor in the drama of the divine descent and ascent. Well, that's the drama. Descends to the level of man, and in descending has to die as God. And this is the great mystery of life through death, he died by becoming man, entering death's door. And dreams for 6,000 years, all the horrors of the world. And then the work is finished. And when the work is complete in man, the fusion has taken place. They aren't two anymore. He's broken down the wall of partition and made of two, one new man. And you are the one new man. And then you see the very blood that was shed for you. And you fuse with it. And as it, up you go. Right in to the ascended state. So I tell you, it's a mystery. Don't try to bring it down to this level. 
to explain it to the secular mind. You can't do it. Whether that mind be the Pope, or Bishop Robinson of the Church of England, or the layman, you can't bring it down to this level. It comes by revelation. But you could believe one who has had the revelation. I ask you to believe it. I can't force you to believe it. But I know what's in store for the believer. I know the joy because you reach the very end of the journey here. Those who have not, I would say, realized it, who have not experienced it, they make their exit here only to be restored to life just like this, only to die again. It's over and over and over until this experience takes place. As told us in the 20th chapter of the book of Luke. So they asked him a simple question. Who asked him? The scientists of the day. They were called Sadducees. They did not believe in the resurrection any more than the scientists of today. They can't find anything that could survive the grave. They open up the skull, they analyze it, put it in the microscope, and they can't find the soul by any instrument that man can devise. So as far as they're concerned, it doesn't exist. There can be no resurrection. So knowing there is no resurrection in their mind, they ask the question, tell me, teacher, Moses in the law said that if a man dies and he left no offspring and that man was married, if he has a brother, the brother should marry the widow to raise up issue for the brother. Well, there were seven brothers. The first one was married and he died leaving no offspring. And the second took her and he died leaving no offspring. And the third took her. And the fourth and finally seven married her. And they die leaving no child. And then she, the woman, died. Whose wife is she in the resurrection? Now bear in mind they did not believe in it. It's a catch question. They're asking him to put him on the spot. And this is the answer that comes from the supernatural being who devised the entire drama for this divine purpose of giving himself to us. And his answer is this. You do not know the scripture. For the sons of this age, and the Greek could be better translated, procreate and are born. But our Bible uses the words marry and are given in marriage which would imply procreation and birth. But it's far better, and you would understand it better, if you would say the sons of this age, they procreate and they are born. But those who are accounted worthy to attain to that age, to the resurrection from the dead, they neither procreate nor are they born. For they cannot die anymore. They are now sons of God, sons of the resurrection. For well, that implies that all other than the resurrected must die again. So when someone dies here and has not been resurrected in that manner that I've tried my best since that moment in my personal life to tell, they are restored to life. And they are in a world just as real as this. Solidly real. Yes, they marry their two. They procreate their two. And they die their two. Just like this world. Just this world. With all the problems that we have here in this world. So the redemption is to be redeemed from this age. There are two ages spoken of in scripture. The sons of this age and those who are accounted worthy to attain to that age. And that is the age of the resurrected. 
So how do I know the story? Well, all of a sudden, all that is said of him begins to unfold in me. If it unfolds in me, then I know I am he. That's the only way you'll ever know that God succeeded in his purpose. Which purpose was to give himself to you as though there were no others in the world. Just God and you. And eventually, only you. He completed the gift and so completely fused with you. The union is complete and you bear his name and his name is I am. For it's happening to you. I am looking at the blood and I am the blood. I look at it and I say within myself, I know it is myself. Oh, my divine creator and redeemer. For my creator is my maker. And my maker is my husband. And my husband left everything and cleaved to me until we fused and became one. When we became one, then he strips that which hid the whole vast scene from what he was doing within me. And he started with the resurrection. Moved from there to the birth, symbolized in that of the infant. And then he brings this into being, and this seems to startle the entire group. No matter where I go, this is the most startling of all the unveiling of his image. The discovery of David. I have gone on TV with ministers, panels, where we had eight on the panel. Nothing disturbed them more than when I make the statement that it takes David to reveal to the individual that he is God the Father. They say, how can you say that, Neville? Do you not know the theology of Christianity? I say, yes, I know it. I know it by revelation. Not as you were taught it in your colleges. You were taught it differently. But I'm correcting you. You've been misinformed. It takes David to reveal you to yourself as God the Father. For the last revelation of the character of God is fatherhood. So we find in the second psalm the statement made to David, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. In the 89th psalm, I have found David. He has cried unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And you will find David, and he is the most heavenly youth you've ever seen. And he will look right into your face and call you father. Yes, call you father. And this relationship is forever. And strangely enough, you know, as he calls you father, it was always so. Because God gradually gives himself to you. And that moment when he gives you David, he gave you fatherhood. And he is the father of David. David has no mother. No mother is named. Not in the ancient scripts. Modern translations try to give it a secular interpretation. And so they will name a mother of David, but not in the ancient scripts. He has no mother. Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And David stands as youth, and David symbolizes, you know what? The whole of humanity, personified as a single youth. So when we are told he put eternity into the mind of man, but he put it in such a way that men could not find out what God had done from the beginning to the end. And that word eternity is the Hebrew word olam. It's translated the world, put the world into the mind of man. The new translation in the Revised Standard Version calls it eternity. For to Hebrew thought, history is composed of all the generations of men and their experiences, all fused into a single whole. 
And this grand hall, in which all the generations are fused, and from which they spring, they call eternity. They call it Olam. So David, the single youth, is the personification of the whole of humanity. And it stands before you, and you are the father of humanity. For God is, and if he succeeds in giving himself to you, he can't hold back one little bit. So if he's the father of humanity, and all together personified as a boy, and the boy comes and calls you father, then he has completed his task to give you himself, and that is to give you fatherhood. And then he takes you up, as you're told in the book of Hebrews, he splits the curtain of the temple, which is your flesh, and then your own blood now, not the blood of bulls, and the blood of goats, and the blood of calves, but your own precious blood, a divine blood, and you take it right up into the temple through the curtain of the flesh. And then comes the final. And that is when the whole work is sealed. And that's the descent of the dove. And the dove descends and smothers you with affection. And as he smothers you with affection, the work is finished. For that is the descent of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. And the wind that is present is the wind spoken of at the very end of the book of John. There are four different endings in the four Gospels, and John being the deepest, and he breathed upon them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, as he breathed upon them. And the Holy Spirit comes symbolized as a dove and descends upon you in the most gentle manner and just smothers you with kisses. And so I tell you, let no one dissuade you from the truth of this great story. It's all told in the Old Testament. That's the foundation. And the new is the interpretation. You can separate them. There would be no new without the old. And to divorce the old from the new, it would have no root. It would have no foundation. So the Old Testament is the core, it is the foundation stone, and the new simply interprets it. And you're told the prophets who prophesied of the coming of this strange supernatural being, they inquired what person or time was indicated by this strange prophecy as they were inspired by the Spirit. But they were told the time was not yet. So until the time came, no one could foresee how it would happen. And you look at this wonderful mystery in prospect, it is so different from what it comes to be seen by you who experience it in retrospect. I know myself, I could never have envisioned what would happen before it did happen. So, I, I can share it with you. This is how it happens. Now, you may want to know, is there another person in the world who has had the experience? Tonight I can answer in the affirmative. A friend of mine in L.A. who's been coming to my meetings for the last three years. He hasn't missed one. A man not quite my age. I'll be 61 my next birthday and he is 54. Well, here about five months ago came the birth of the child. Well, like all women in the world, Although the child comes in a similar manner, it need not be a duplicate of your next door neighbor's birth. I have a niece who has had three caesarean operations. The children are normal. Three perfectly lovely children. Now a caesarean is not a normal or natural birth, but you can bring forth the child. So she has three ch children that are alive in her world, there are others that will come in another manner. So I cannot say it must come in this and this only. No. For his differed somewhat, not too much. He woke to find himself, he thought, I'm going insane. The wind, it's an unearthly wind. You can't describe it. It's wind because the word wind 
and spirit are the same in both Greek and in Hebrew. So you can use the word spirit or you can use the word wind. And so they use the word wind sometimes, they use the word spirit. But in my own case, it's wind. But he felt the wind permeating his whole being. And he thought, what's happening to me? I do not know what a stroke would be like. I've never had one. But am I going to have a stroke? What is taking place in my world? And this kept on for hours. He got up, went outside, got into his car, drove down to a sunset, went for the longest walk, and the wind is still permeating his skull, and he can't shake it. Not a thing he can do about it. So he came on back, and there were workmen working in the area. And he started up the stairs. He has a lovely home in the hills of Hollywood. He started up the steps to his home, when suddenly something popped out of his head, and he jumped forward and screamed out, My God! And here was an infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. He said, I wouldn't turn around for the workmen. I knew they would see what I was holding. It was so objectively real to me, I couldn't see how anyone could not have seen what I held in my hand. So I walked into the room, still holding the infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. Four and a half months later, the wind again comes upon him, and he's permeated. He knows and remembers now what happened, the birth of the child, not knowing what to expect now. And suddenly, as it begins to subside, there in his doorway stands this David of biblical fame and calls him my father. The same order of arrangement, the same chronological order, as happened to me, as I have told it in my book. So I say, yes, tonight I have one who can come forward as a witness to the truth of what I've told you. But I know everyone in this world who has heard the story and accepted it will give birth to that child, will discover David, will ascend as the blood of God, and will find the dove descending upon him. Everyone. So don't try to analyze it on this level. It doesn't make sense. It has nothing to do with this world. This is the world of death. But man will not believe it. He thinks this is the world of the living. And this is the world of the dead. Everything here is really dead. I've had moments where I came into a room and knew if I could arrest something within me which I felt, everything would stand still. I did it and they stood still. Not one could move, not even the bird in flight could continue its flight. And it didn't fall. It should have, but it didn't. Because if I should suspend the motion that carries a ball across this room, the ball should fall. If our concept of gravitation is true, but the bird did not fall, and the leaf falling fell not. Well, I can see the waitress walking, and walking not, when I arrested her motion, because she was standing on the floor. I can see the fellow dining, when I arrested his motion from within me, not continuing the action of completing the soup. But the bird, why should the bird just remain stationary in space, when that Activity in me was arrested. But when I released it, everything continued and completed its intention. The bird flew, the wages brought the food, and the diner dined. And all things became once more animated. And the power was not there, it was within me. So that I tasted on these occasions the power of the age to come. That's the energy, the power that you and I will exercise in that age, called the age of the resurrected. So here, believe this story as suggested in the book of Isaiah and fulfilled in the story of Jesus Christ. You're told he is the groom and we the bride. But the groom, going back to the second chapter of Genesis, must leave everything and cleave to his wife until they become one. 
because God is one. When he was asked what's the greatest of all the commandments, he didn't mention anything as recorded as commandments. He called upon the faith of Israel, which is known as the great Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. No room for two, only one. So we are told in Zechariah, in that day the Lord will be one and his name one. And that name is I am. I am does not signify two, it's one. So I tell you in the end, you and I will be one. For you'll be the father of my son. And my son will be your son. Therefore we are one. And yet without loss of identity. So when you read it and you can't quite extract the meaning, persist. But don't try to change it to make it conform to your concept on this level. It's not written for this level. It's written as a hope that men will take and stretch out as it were and believe the most incredible story in the world. That God could die. And in dying, make us so alive, we will awake one day as God. That God becomes man, that man may become God. That's the most incredible story in the world. And yet I tell you, it is true. So you try it. I'll try it. You accept it. <clears throat> and put your hope fully upon this grace that is coming to you. At the revelation of Jesus Christ. Don't be offended with the use of the word. Jesus Christ is your own wonderful human imagination. That's Jesus Christ. He's already entered death's door. Listen to these words. If we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So here, the death is over. We have been united with him in the death like his. We enter death's door, the human skull. And therefore, we now know if we are united in his death, we shall be united in his resurrection. And he resurrects in us one by one. That's how he resurrects. And it's only Jesus Christ that really resurrects. But if you resurrect, are you not he? Don't be ashamed. You are he. And boldly declare it. You are the being called Christ Jesus. And Christ Jesus and Jehovah are one. There's no room for two. It is simply the unfolding and the interpretation of the great mystery as described and given to us in the Old Testament. Now let us go into the silence. We use the word, they that are accounted worthy to obtain that age. Yes. Does this imply that some of us are not going to make it? No, it does not imply that at all. He who began a good work in you, he will bring it to completion. It's a gift, it's not earned. It's completely unmerited. Because it's unmerited, no one can earn it. It's grace. And grace means God's gift of himself to man. That's what grace means. No, it does not. To me, it doesn't. They who are counted worthy, in other words, the work to that degree has been done, and is automatically unveiled. They are worthy to be unveiled. Undoubtedly, if you took the Greek word translated worthy, you could give a different definition of it. I find I have maybe 40, at least 40 Bibles at home, and no two agree in the translation of the word. So I use many Bibles to satisfy my feeling towards the passage. After all, we are at a disadvantage when we don't speak the tongue. We have to depend upon a concordance. You take a concordance and look up all the definitions. Then take the translations and see what this one said and the other one said. And then come to your own conclusion. 
So what the word worthy in the one I quoted tonight would be in another book, another Bible, I do not know. You take that simple little passage, which has confused so many people, who by taking thought, because we say all things are possible to man. That's what we say. And then in certain translations they say, who by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature. Well, that would tell me all things are not possible, would it not? No. The modern translation in the Revised Standard Version, instead of using space, they use time. And they say, who by being anxious could add one hour to his span of life. But that's an entirely different interpretation of that Greek passage. Now what, I'm not a Greek, I do not know, what was the intention of the author when he wrote that? I know time would agree with the Old Testament. It's agreeing with Ecclesiastes. It's a time to be born, time to die. Like a great play, it's a time to make your entrance and your exit from a play. You might be given certain freedom of interpretation when you're on the stage and do certain things with the part, but you have a cue to enter and a cue to exit. And so Ecclesiastes does not allow us for one moment to believe that any scientist could prolong your life there in spite of the claim to the contrary. They claim that today with a new diet, and a better understanding of diet, that we can take a man and make him live longer. That belongs to this age, this section of time called the 20th century. But when you see it, the 16th century has not ceased to be because to us in the 20th it is history. It is still taking place and this will always be taking place. So the wheel is closed, that's what Ezekiel tells us, and that's what Ecclesiastes tells us. Is there a thing of which it is said, see this is new? It has been already, in ages past. But there's no remembrance of former things, nor shall there be any remembrance of things to come after, among those who will come later. But that was written three, four thousand years ago. But we don't believe it today. We believe you can by watching your diet and doing this and doing the other. And so then we look at a person like a Churchill who violated every rule in the book concerning diet and health. Smoked 20 odd cigars a day, drank two quarts of liquor a day, ate like a pig, and finally at the end died at the age of 90. And the dietitians who know all about it, you read their obituary in the morning, he was 52 had a little heart attack, or he had a little something else. And they know everything about it, but they make their exit on time. But Churchill made his exit on time too. I have a friend of mine in Barbados, I took him home, oh it must have been 25 years ago. He was an alcoholic in the extreme. Find him in the gutter. A man whose father had means and wanted him brought home. And so he asked my father to bring him home and he came to America and we found him in the gutter, bloated and drinking the straight, straight alcohol. It was prohibition days. Well, no one would have given, well, you could have put any bet that they wouldn't live a month, but he's still there. He's now about 85, 87. How he survived, I would like to see all the dietitians look at him. And yet, you can't seem to kill him. He drinks anything under the sun, eats anything, and he can't seem to die. Because the cue hasn't been given. Yes, ma'am. No. No. Blake uses 6,000 once, he did say 8, but it's 6 to 6. I behold the visions of my deadly sleep of 6,000 years. He says, I see the present, past, and future, 6,000 years. That the play, as far as man goes, that he has to dream the dream of life while the work is being done within him. For that primal wish remains the primal wish, let us make man in our image. That's the decision. 
And so, that's the wish of God, to make man in his image. But he can give himself to a man that is not his image. So he has to complete it and perfect it. So be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, we are told. When that image in the eye of God is perfect, he gives him himself. It's like a seed. Any other questions, please? In evolution, in the appearance of man, yes. In the creation of God, no. In the appearance of man, it's a time when I used to hold the field with a little hole. Today we use a tractor to do it. It was a time when a man would take a raft and go across the river. And then he evolved some other means of doing it. He got a boat, then a sailboat, then a steamboat. And then he has the big ocean liner today. And so we take, take man, and in the affairs of man, we can see the evolution. But there is no evidence to support the claim that a bird was anything other than a bird. A bird always milk made its nest. And birds are making their nests today as they did as far back as man can go. He can't find where a bird was ever other than a bird, in spite of the claims to the contrary. But there's no evidence to support it. We haven't any. Go to all the museums, and you might find some artist taking some putty or clay and trying to prove, not prove, but I mean, to show what our scientists mean that out of the swampy land came this, and then became that, and became that. But we have nothing to support it. What? Well, that's not uh, to be taken that way. You are Adam and Eve. It's not a little theory that a man was suddenly made, made out of clay. No. The, don't, don't bring the Bible down to this level. Adam, and God, put it this way, they are really one. If you take the verb of the word yod heh vav -he, it's hey vav -he. The ancient Hebraic meaning of the word was to fall, or causatively, the one who causes to fall. Or it was to blow, or causatively, the one who caused the wind to blow. So that the fall was a deliberate thing on the part of the creator of it all. The fall is not what the churches talk about. You and I, as we are told in scripture, God made all men disobedient. The 11th chapter of the book of Romans. He made us disobedient that he may have mercy upon all. So what was the disobedience? So man had to leave the world of innocence and enter the world of experience and then move up to the world of imagination. And so to leave the world of innocence, I must have experience. So I taste of the knowledge of good and evil. So a conscience is born. You couldn't condemn a person who has no conscience. He could shoot you and not think he's done anything wrong. Well, you can shoot him back, but he doesn't know why. But if he tastes of the knowledge of good and evil and enters the world of experience, well then, from then on, in the world of experience, he's going to suffer with his conscience. And then he will awaken into the world of imagination. But he has to be brought out of the world of innocence into the world of experience. So it's a plot, it's a plan. He planned everything as it has come out and as it's going to be consummated. As we are told again in Isaiah, as I have planned it, so shall it be. And as I have purposed it, so shall it stand. And my will shall not turn back, this is now Jeremiah, until I have executed and accomplished the intents of my mind. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. But not until the very end will man understand the necessity for suffering. If I didn't suffer, and I could put my hand on fire and just lose a hand. But he made me sensitive enough to put my hand near heat and detect danger. But suppose I couldn't detect it. 
I wasn't sensitive enough. <clears throat> I could lose my hand on a stove. So we have reason for the suffering behind it all. But in the end, the glory transcends the suffering. For the glory is God's gift of himself to you. Yes, sir. What man can imagine, man becomes, he does. Yes, man's imagination is manifested in the imaginations of others. Look at this room right now. There isn't a thing in this room that wasn't first only imagined. Look at it. But go into the vast, vast world. You can find one thing that wasn't first only imagined. But there are intervals between the imaginal state and its fulfillment. It has to be first imagined. So Isaac Newton asked the question, can man go forth where his imagination has never walked before? And the answer is no. We are now sending men in space and they're getting out of their vehicles and floating in space. It had first to be imagined before it could be done. And today we are finding all kinds of things here below the earth, below the sea. Tomorrow we're going to find things like gloves and hats floating in space. Oh, he already lost one glove, didn't he? It's there forever. Somebody's going to find the glove that he lost. And some man is going to find the little thing snip one day, and he'll be there. He'll be floating in space. They'll find him one day. All things that man can imagine, man can realize. So I ask you to imagine only the lovely. Only the loveliest things in this world. And then let them happen. They will happen. Until tomorrow. Thank you.